Hey everybody, Edo here, and this is my top 10 games of 2022. And if you aren't familiar with my top 10 games, these are all games which I reviewed on my channel, Gaming with Edo, uh, in 2022. So they don't all, they weren't all released in 2022, not necessarily every game I played, but each one of these I can point you to a review, which I will, and linked in the description from this year. That's how I break it down. Um, before diving in to the top 10, a and, and these aren't Kickstarter previews, I'll do a different video for that. But before diving in, a couple like really interesting observations, at least to me, of this set. Firstly, eight of these 10 games I purchased myself. Uh, they weren't provided to me by publishers. One was from a publisher, the other was um, a, a gift from a friend, um, which I, I think is a shift. Previously, I think there were more from publishers. I mean, I can also anecdotally say I don't get as many games from publishers these days. Um, I don't know if it if it's more me editing down and saying no more to games that I know that aren't as interesting to me or self-identifying things that I like um, or or what <laughs> the mac macroeconomics. I don't know. But certainly a uh, few of these were, were from publishers, though I did do many reviews from products provided by publishers and I appreciate it. So that's observation number one. Observation number two, over 50%, six of these games are two player only games. Um, I think that is still a little bit of a reflection, especially since a lot of them were the ones that I purchased, um, of not having as many regular gaming groups still due to pandemic or otherwise. Um, a number of folks moved out of the area. Like a lot of my gaming groups that were sort of the regulars dissipated this year for like somebody moved this, that, and actually a lot of people moved. A lot of people moved out of the Bay Area because <laughs> it's expensive among other reasons. Um, and so that's like one of my things for this coming years. I wanna rebuild some of those bigger game groups. Obviously there's still opportunity to play games with more players, I do. But I think when it came to what are the games I'm gonna buy and look at as like, I know I'm gonna get to the table more. I think it was easier to play two players. It's also easier to play a game with my wife or my son than necessarily to get everyone together in the family to play a game. So. That was a driver. And the other one that is really interesting is 50% of these are existing IP, um, sort of expansion sequels, two-player versions, alternate versions of just long-standing top-flight IP in the board board game IP. And um, and they also they, they constitute the entire top five. And that's really interesting to me. I think. I get to play and see a lot of indie titles and smaller games, but one of the things that I think has been happening is there was a, this explosion of creativity, quality, innovation that came out of Kickstarter and indie dev. Um, and I think for a while it like overtook um, the novelty in the in, in the bigger studios, bigger companies. But actually, I think progressively those uh, longer, older dinosaur companies have been paying more attention to um, what people have been like, like I think the industry caught up to what the innovators were doing and also very much hired them all. <laughs> like a lot of those folks that have been doing these things have been rolled up into these organizations. You also see some organizations like I'll specifically call out Lucky Duck Games, which uh, is an innovator from that space, but is now like a gigantic organization and a major driver. You see, you know, Roxley, Stonemeyer Games, a lot of these organizations that are, are, are or those are, I mean, like, Lucky Duck Games is in a category of becoming a major worldwide publisher of all sorts of things, while those other two examples are more, you know, still sort of singularly focused um, creators. But I think they're still really good examples of, like, the elevation and, and leveling out over the last decade that this all happened. And so it's just super interesting to me to look at it and think of it in the context of these reviews. But presumably you uh, are less interested in those observations, or maybe I'll make another video with them, and more interested in the game. So let's get started. So coming in at number 10, two-player game. This is the only game I received from a publisher, and it is a Japanese import called Tooth and Claw. This is one of those, like, like tactic war, like, 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 like card game war type games where it's two-player head-to-head, and we are going to be like flipping over and revealing cards that essentially are attacking against a line of units. What's so really like a front line, two front lines. What's really interesting about this game is how you set up your midline and your back line. So you have nine versus nine cards, but they go by lines. Um, and I love the artwork and style. And it was just a really, like I really enjoyed it as a two player uh, tactics game. So 
that's number 10. Coming in at number nine is Morals. This was a two-player game that I hadn't ever played. It's nature-themed, um, and I really enjoy it. It's a set collection game, which a lot of Pencil First games are, um, and it's got a nice line of cards that you are picking through with your, with your opponent, and you're just sort of uh, working towards... Um, you know, getting the most points, or, but you're doing it by picking up certain types of mushrooms, and there's this interesting mechanic where things, like, sort of dry up and get old as time goes by, and whether you're going to, like, pick up the bucket of, of old stuff, and lots well, of little, it's, it's, um, it needs a little, I mean, it's old game, it's not going to change now, but, like, the, the UI was a little not my favorite, but uh, I, I felt like I enjoyed the game very much, and actually it was really interesting because there was a bunch of, like, in the edition I had, it called out, like, feedback the creator had received from board game geek that was now like a different way like there was an issue where like managing the flop it's like the i forget the nature line um it's a little cumbersome and, and somebody had recommended a wheel and then they added the wheel to the rule so a lot of interesting um i thought that was very interesting to see within the product really to the, like a sheet that's like this board game geek uh bat user suggested this idea like very here's the thread it was very interesting um number eight is um Enchanted Plumes, another two-player game, simple set collection game, super pretty. You're just making, um, you're 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 building out a uh, uh, like a, a, a um, plumes. What are the what's that? A peacock. It's all peacock feathers. They're beautiful, and it's set collection where you are collecting different types of of colors, and they have like some different art on it. But basically, colored feathers, and the way you build your pyramid starts reducing the amount of feathers you can select, and it's a little bit of a push your up collection game. And actually, I called that game a two-player game. I'm realizing now that actually that probably wasn't a two-player game. And Enchanted Poop did support more than two players. So 50% of these games are two-player games. I don't know why in my head. I mean, I played it so many times with two players is I think what, what got it. Okay, next is a two-player game. Coming in at number seven is Air, Land, and Sea. And, you know, if, if you're like, Marvel Snap is so amazing. It's so, in, in, you know, uh, innovative and cool and crazy. It's like, no, the, the Airland and Sea is exactly it. Three locations and they uh, implement, you know, like the cards you play affect the ones you side. It's basically Marvel Snap. I mean, there, there are some unique differences, but it's like, it's pretty close. If you played Airland and Sea and you started playing Marvel Snap, you're like, oh, somebody just like had played like Airland and Sea and made Marvel Snap. But um, it's great, super fun, fast, head-to-head -head two-player game. Really enjoyed it. Coming in at number six, Crash, oh, and that one was the one that was given to me by Seth, a friend. Crash Octopus is this fantastic production where it's a dexterity game and you're like collecting treasures uh, and you're there's like octopus and, and, and it, it, you're like moving your ships around. Very um, neat little um, flick game with incredible components. Uh, check out the review, super cool, really enjoyed it. Um, that was also an interesting purchase I made because it was so striking, but I don't know. I mean, it's like a small box, but it was like 45 bucks. So it was expensive. But like when you open it, you're like, oh, I see why it's all this incredible componentry. Um, okay. So that was the, 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 the six now coming in and number five is exit, uh, nightfall manor. This is one of the exit games, puzzle games. Uh, overall, uh, we love unlocks. Exit games that we haven't played this yet, but excited for Unlock Kids. And it's like literally over here, we've got the advent calendar we're playing through. We like all of it, but I, I really felt Night uh, Fall Manor stood out to me. The narrative's like pretty benign, or benign, ben is that the what I want to say? Just basic <laughs> for like, on a, you know, plain maybe is the right way to say it. But I really enjoyed the integration of the puzzle, the progress through. It was like the best of that series. Um, and for that reason, it made the list. Um, number four is Seven Wonder... Seven Wonders Architects. So this to me was one of the titles that was the epitome of seeing the sort of dinosaur organizations come back and look at what was happening in Kickstarter and modern innovative game design and implement it, right? You open it up, it's got all sorts of little uh, trays inside, really easy to keep and sort. And then what you're doing is you're creating your wonders in front of you, but they're like really evocative componentry of like, the board that shapes the piece, and then you are going to be, it's like a simplification of wonders where you're selecting from a deck between you and your opponent, like the person on your right or the person on the left from the center, and it's just set collection. But um, really easy to teach, easy to play, very visually satisfying game that just did, wouldn't have existed 
um, I feel like 10, 15 years ago um, in, in, in the manner in which it does. And so I was really impressed with it. And it, you know, not scared, but like sort of like, oh, well, it's now everyone's doing these, these games. Uh, coming in at number three is Sobek to Players. <laughs> this is a game I tried to get a review copy and it just never happened. I filled out a form, but whatever. I was like, I want to play it anyway. Um, I never played the original Sobek, but this version, I think, is an absolutely stellar two-player game. I mean, stellar. It is so much fun. I really love it. I really love two-player games that are that fun. And actually, it really sort of has vibes similar to the number two. Um, and I went back and forth on which I should put two or three. Um Number two is, oh, oh, and Sobek, you have, you are collecting, it's a set, I like set collection games, it's pretty, uh, but the novelty there is you're sort of collecting from a grid, and what you select on the grid then points to where your opponent can select. And there's a lot of other things, but that's really the, the nuance of how I'm collecting, and then point, not points out, but a lot of different places you can use your resources, like a lot of different like powers and abilities, but the nuance is on that grid. Now, at number two is Splendor Duel. Splendor Tool at Duel has like, very similar grid, very similar refill of that grid. The distinction is more that each player, the, the how they end their turn doesn't literally impact the other player, which is, is true in Sobek, but basically as things get removed from the board, it forces the other player to make different and tough decisions. Um, I really think these two are, are tied. I guess, if anything, Splendor Duel is like slightly faster to set up, and with the removal of like, a lot of the extra, like, Sobek two players has just more little rules and powers in a way that, I mean, um, Splendor two, Duel has some powers, but, like, just one, same fun, but one notch easier just to, like, explain and teach and start new with new players. So, like, I, I gave, they both have great components, Splendor Duel is probably a little higher, so that's why I got the win, but I, both of these games I'd be happy to play again and again and again, and I have played them again and again. So, um... Coming in at number one for 2022 is uh, Clank Legacy. I obviously, or, you know, it, it, I mean, I think it's normally, I think it might be on the top 10 in BGG, normally ranked as like one, two, or three best ever Legacy game, and fully and completely delivered. Really fun and exciting to be able to play through an entire Legacy experience with my family and my kids. Um, haven't been able, have done lots of Legacy in adult groups, but being able to like keep my 15 and 12 year old engaged enough to go through it was really exciting. Um, I'm blown away by it. You know, all of these games in the top, in the top five for me when I play it is like, makes me want to make those games, right? Like, like looking at the legacy titles, like this is so much work. It's amazing, but also inspiring to be like, well, maybe it'd be fun to do something in the space. Um, the two player games as well. So anyway, that's my top 10. I really easy to recommend all of these. Most are still in print because I know Jessica got some 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 fire about picking a lot of not in print games, but I don't I don't see any problem with that, but I get it. The hardest thing to find here would probably be Tooth and Claw, though I believe you can buy it and maybe Crash Octopus. I don't think you're gonna have a hard time finding any of the other things. Um, maybe Morals, I don't know. But anyway, that's my top 10 games of 2020. Hey everybody, Edo here, and thanks for watching Gaming with Edo. Reviews over here on this playlist, League and Insider videos over here on this one. Subscribe, share, all that good stuff, but most importantly, play some great games. Thanks.